In this video, I'm going to talk through a situation with a low friction car connected by a string to another mass over a pulley. And the two things we're going to figure out is number one, what is the acceleration of the two object system? And during acceleration, what is the tension in the connecting string? We're going to use the known masses of the cars. So the low friction car has a mass of about 0.357 kilograms and hanging mass up to the mass of about 0.1 kilograms to predict what the acceleration should be theoretically and during acceleration, whatever that value is, what we'd expect the tension in the string to be. Once we make our predictions, we're going to find out what the acceleration and tension actually are, because in this situation, I have a motion detector, which is going to be measuring how the velocity of our system is changing. And from that changing velocity, we can get an acceleration estimate from the slope of our velocity versus time graph. And I also have a wireless force sensor connected to our string, which is directly measuring the tension in the string at any point in this situation. So what is the acceleration of the two object system? We're going to assume that friction is low enough to be considered negligible between the car and this horizontal track. And then we're going to use a motion detector to verify our answer. Well, already at this point in class, we've predicted the acceleration of objects if we know the sum of the forces or the net force on that object and we divide by that object's mass. This is known as Newton's second law. Well, we can use Newton's second law for single objects and systems of multiple objects. And so if we want to figure out the acceleration of object A or object B, since they're connected by a string, they have the same acceleration. Let's figure out the acceleration of the system as a whole. So we're going to define the system as both cart A and this hanging mass object B. So if we want to find out the acceleration of the system, we need to take the sum of the forces on the entire system and then divi divide by the mass of the entire system, which is going to be 0.357 kilograms plus 0.1 kilograms, because the sum of the forces or the net force is accelerating all of this mass. So in order to figure out the sum of the forces on the system, let's find out or let's think through what are all the forces on each part of the system and then add it together and see if anything cancels out. So let's just first start with object A. We know there's a gravitational force on object A by the Earth because it has mass, so the Earth is pulling it straight down. It's on a horizontal surface, and so that surface will be compressed and pushed back up with a normal force perpendicular to the surface. So there's a normal force on object A. And then while this is accelerating, there's tension in the string. And so on cart A, this string is pulling to the right. So we're adding a force of tension on A. Well, what about B? Uh, B is also connected to the string, and so there's going to be force of tension, in this case, pulling up on B. Because remember, ropes or stretched material always pulls, it never pushes. And so if the string is above object B, it's pulling up on it. So there's, there's a force of tension on object B. And finally, because object B has mass, this hanging mass is about 0.1 kilograms, it's feeling a gravitational force downward. And so on our system, we have five individual forces. So before we start thinking through what the size of all these forces are and adding them together, let's think through, are any of these forces going to cancel each other out? Are they the same size in opposite directions? Well, if we look back at object A, we've got the gravitational force and this normal force. And when the system is accelerating, uh, it's, object A is just accelerating or increasing its velocity to the right. And so there's no change in vertical velocity here. So these two forces have to be the same size. And they're in the opposite directions. And so they're going to cancel out. And one other thing I want to mention, uh, we need to define a direction. Um, object A is accelerating to the right. That's considered positive. Object B is accelerating downwards. So we consider that negative. But since we're treating this like a, a system that's doing one thing that has the same acceleration because they're connected by a string, we're going to define our positive direction as this way. So we'll say that object A and object B are both accelerating in our positive direction. And if any force points the other way, we'll consider that the negative direction. Okay. So because the normal force and gravity on object A are equal in size and opposite direction, they cancel each other out. They don't affect the acceleration of the system. Well, let's think through these two tension forces. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but we're going to consider this pulley to be ideal, which means it has negligible mass and there's not any friction. When you have ideal pulleys, 
all ideal pulleys do is they change the direction of tension. They don't change the size of tension. So the amount of tension in the string over here will be the same as the amount of tension the string connected to object B. So whatever these two tension forces are during acceleration, they have to be the same size. So what is the tension on object A trying to do? Well, it's pulling in the how we've defined the positive direction. It's trying to speed up the system. And what is tension B doing? Tension B is, as we've defined the direction, it's pointed in the negative direction. The tension on, on, on object B is trying to decrease the system speed. And so we have two forces in opposite directions that are the same size. And so those two tension forces are also going to cancel each other out. And another way to think about this is these two tension forces are internal to the system. And when we're adding up forces to figure out the acceleration of something or a system of objects, these have to be external forces to the system. So it looks like out of all five individual forces, there's only one force that's not canceled out. It's the force of gravity on the hanging mass of 0.1 kilograms. So if we want to predict the acceleration, all we have to do is figure out the size of the, the force of gravity pulling down on object B, the hanging mass, and divide by the mass of the entire system to give us the acceleration of the system. So let's do that. We know that object B has a mass of 100 grams or 0.1 kilograms. And so to find the weight of an object with known mass, we multiply the mass times the gravitational field strength of the Earth, which is about 10 newtons for each kilogram. We know it's more specifically 9.8 newtons per kilogram, but on an AP test or a test in my class, uh, 10 is sufficient. We can just use 10 for the gravitational field strength. And we then have to divide by the mass of the entire system because this force is accelerating not just the hanging mass, it's accelerating the entire system's mass, which is 0.357 kilograms plus 0.1 kilograms, giving us 0.457 kilograms. So if we look in the numerator, we've got a kilograms divided by a kilogram units they cancel. So 0.1 times 10 newtons. We get that the sum of the forces on the system or the net force on the system is positive one Newton because it's pointed in our positive direction as we've defined it. And we're dividing by the mass of the entire system. And so that gives us a predicted acceleration of, well, the units are 2.19 Newtons for each kilogram. But remember, if we're plugging in forces in Newtons and masses in kilograms in Newton's second law, it's going to give us units of acceleration in meters per second for each second. So our predicted acceleration is about 2.19 meters per second per second. Well, let's go back and figure out, is that the acceleration of the system if these are the, the masses, assuming friction is negligible? So looking at the velocity versus time graph, we can see that as soon as I let it go, as soon as the system starts increasing speed, first of all, we notice that it's increasing velocity in a linear way. So our system does have a constant acceleration. And if we want to know what that acceleration is, all we have to do is find the slope of our velocity versus time graph to figure that out. So here's what that is. We predicted the acceleration was going to be 2.19 meters per second each second. And we just find add a linear fit to the spot where it's increasing velocity in a linear way. Looks like the slope is 2.067, which is about 2.07 meters per second each second. And so our predicted acceleration, thinking through the implications of Newton's second law and the sum of the forces on the system, gives us a prediction which is quite close to what it actually is. And it's a little bit lower, but why might it actually be lower? What did we assume was true about the forces on the system? Well, we assumed that the force of friction between the car on the level track and the track was negligible, so it probably wasn't zero. <laughs> So we would expect a little bit lower acceleration than what we predicted. But this shows us that our technique of adding together all the forces on a multi-object system, figuring out what the sum of the forces on it, and dividing by the mass of the entire system does give us something that matches up with reality. So now that we know the acceleration of the system, let's think through what the tension in the string would be during acceleration. But before we do that, let's think through an easier question. What would the tension be if the system was at rest while I was still holding it? So if I'm holding the car, 
what would be true of the tension inside of the string? Well, the easiest way to answer that question would be f just look at the forces on the hanging mass that is at rest. So let's make a simple little force diagram. So let's define our system not as the two object system. Let's just define it as the system being just object B, what's hanging on the end of the string at rest. So with a 0.1 kilogram mass, we know gravity is pulling down with one Newton of force. We know it's in the negative direction, but let's just say the magnitude of it is one Newton. And if it's not moving, we know the sum of the forces on just that part of the system, or system B, has to be zero because it's moving at a constant velocity of zero. So there has to be something balancing that out. In that case, it's tension, right? Those are the only two significant forces on the mass. The force of gravity pulling down with one Newton. So tension has to be one Newton in size pulling back up. And if the tension in the string, the vertical string is one Newton, and if this pulley is I is ideal, that means this tension, which is connected to our force sensor, should also be one Newton. So if we look at what this force sensor is reading right now as I'm holding it, we can see that it is indeed about one Newton in size. Well, let's make a prediction. Once I let it go, what, well, is the tension going to be still one Newton while it's accelerating, or will it change? Well, let's just, again, go back to object B. Once I let this thing go, the car starts to speed up to the right and the mass starts to speed up down, both in what we defined as a positive direction. And what would have to happen to tension in order for the mass to start speeding up in the negative direction? Well, once I let it go, I'm not changing gravity's pull on it. It's still pulling down with one Newton. And if this mass starts to speed up in the negative y direction, that must be because the force of tension got smaller. So the sum of the forces on it was in the negative y direction, therefore increasing its speed. So we would expect that the tension goes down during acceleration. It's less than one Newton, but we don't know how much. So let's, let's see if we can predict that. If we're gonna find the tension between object A and B during acceleration, let's change our system definition. Like it doesn't have to, even though there's two objects connected and they're both speeding up, we don't have to define the system as everything. Just like before, we define the system as just object B. In this case, let's define our system as just object A, or car A. And if we go back to Newton's second law, we can use Newton's second law just putting in information for our new system definition. So the acceleration of car A is equal to the sum of the forces on car A divided by the mass of car A. And in this equation, what do we already know? Well, we know the system as a whole has an acceleration of about 2.19 meters per second each second, which means both car A and car B have that magnitude acceleration. So we know car A's acceleration, and we know its mass is 0.357 kilograms. So if we plug in those known values, we can figure out the size of the sum of the forces on car A. And if we look at the forces on car A, we know gravity and the normal force cancel each other out. So when we add up these forces, the only thing left over is the tension force. So the size of the, the sum of the forces is just equal to tension on car A. So the acceleration of car A is equal to the tension force on it, because that's the sum of the forces divided by its mass. So let's just plug in 2.19 meters per second each second for car A's acceleration. We're going to plug in the mass of car A, 0.357 kilograms, and the only unknown is the force of tension. So let's solve for that. Let's undo the dividing by the mass of car A. So I'm going to multiply each side of our equation by the mass of the car, 0.357 kilograms. On the right side, the mass cancels out, and we get that tension is equal to the mass, of the tension on A is equal to the mass of car A times its acceleration. And if we take 0.357 kilograms times 2.19 meters per second each second, it gives us 0.78, and we're solving for force, so we'd expect the units would be newtons, as long as we plugged in kilograms for mass and meters per second per second for acceleration. So this is our predicted acceleration. When the car was at rest, or the system was at rest, we saw that the force sensor read that there was one Newton of tension, and we ex expected it to be smaller, and this is predicting about 0.2 Newtons smaller. So let's see what actually happened. So as soon as I let it go, you can see on the force versus time graph, it goes from one Newton and it immediately drops and it's changing a little bit, 
but it's more or less flat. And we can see that it's a little less, it's between 0.8 and 0.6 newtons. Remember, we predicted, what, 0.78? Let's find out if we look at the values during acceleration of the tension and then find the average, let's see how close we got. So our prediction was 0.78 newtons. And when I selected this region of the graph and found the average or the mean value, we got about 0.711 or about 0.71 newtons. So we can see our predicted value of 0.78 newtons was pretty close to the actual value of tension during acceleration. So hopefully this gives you some confidence in using Newton's second law to figure out lots of different things about a multi-object system that's increasing speed. And this also works for decreasing speed, but we won't use this video to go over examples like that. As a review, we first started out by finding the acceleration of the two-object system by defining the system as both objects, adding up all the forces and dividing by the mass of the entire system. Then to figure out the tension between the two objects, we had to define the system as just one of the objects. And we did that for car A, and we found out the sum of the forces on it because we knew the mass and its acceleration, so then we knew what the force of tension was. I hope this video has been helpful.